I'm Caitlin McCullough and welcome to my TED Talk. Thank you guys for being here. So my research question is what has caused the housing crisis and what factors are contributing to the continuation of it? Nationally, there is a shortage of more than 7 million affordable homes for our nation's 10.8 million plus extremely low income families. Millions of people fear not having a home one day due to rising costs of living and salaries that just aren't keeping up. Housing is an essential need. Housing that's below adequate deeply affects people's physical and mental health and future life outcomes and jobs and progression in life overall. The term housing crisis is referring to widespread shortages of housing in certain regions where people want to live. The housing crisis has been starting to show over the past two decades as the amount of housing has not kept up with the amount of people needing housing. But after 2020, or COVID, there we, we saw a huge spike in housing costs due to numerous factors, like disrupt in the supply chain and people wanting to move out of cities, which we see the effect of in many and most small towns. This is just a stat, the one in the left corner um, of the what I just shared. And then this is a little pie chart of the severely cost burden of renters, and as you can see that the 72% is extremely low income, very low income, 6% low income, and the smallest percent is middle income and above median income. And then this is just like a little picture to give you a mental kind of picture of what it might look like for low income renters looking for a house. Because there's only probably three like good houses that have the price that they need, the room that they need, a good area, but then there's all of these people trying to get it. So I looked into a lot of different factors that are adding to and have caused the worsening of this crisis, but I'm going to focus on four big things that help us see why we're here and why this crisis is only continuing to get worse. So here's two other graphs to kind of see why and what this is. So here I have the growing year compared to the average house cost. And as you can see, starting at 1981 to 2023, it's just continuing to go up. And in 2020, we have a big spike. And now we have this huge spike here. And then this is average household income compared to average household cost. And this is a projection that goes all the way up to 2080. But as we can see, our income <laughs> compared to our house is going to be pretty bad. <laughs> so I'm going to start off by talking about the history of segregation in housing and how it plays a huge role in housing today. So areas where people of color predominantly lived were targeted in many different ways leaving lasting impacts on the worth and progression of development in those areas. So, in an article I read by Reese, it stated that before the civil rights movement, separate but equal was accepted as a norm. An example of this was white neighborhoods and black neighborhoods. These separate neighborhoods were not equal, and they created a massive divide in quality of life and opportunities and races. Although these injustices were abolished, it didn't stop the government from continuing to pursue a legal action and working to pursue separate areas for the different races. The National Library of Medicine emphasized the hypocrisy of this is that by the end of the 1960s, legal segregation was abolished, but residential segregation still continued and still continues in every metropolitan area in the United States today. So here I just have an example of what redlining looked like, and it was literally like on a map, they drew red lines of where people of color predominantly lived, and they would not provide the loans even if they were like, even if they were accountable to get them. And then here's just another example of what that could look like. So here we have the exact same house, same bedroom, same bathroom, looks the same. But since this is a white family, it was worth more. And since this is a family of color, it was worth less. And then, I'll explain what redlining is. So redlining is the act of denying people access to credit based on where they live, not if they're eligible and qualified for the loan. History shows that mortgage lenders used to redline predominantly black populated and core urban neighborhoods. In an article I read by Rose, it stated that no loan could be economically sound if the property was located in a neighborhood that was or could become populated by black people. As property values might decline over the life of the 15 to 20 year loans they were attempting to standardize. Although redlining was outlawed, its effects were large and still persist today. Multiple studies show that redlining's harmful legacy has left non-white communities struggling with air pollution, reproductive health disorders, and fewer urban amenities more than 50 years later. So what this all means is just that since these areas have been kept down, they haven't been able to gain equity or value, making them undesirable, leading to lower income people living in them. 
But since they're so cheap, developers are starting to buy them up and raise the rent prices. This housing segregation redlining changed the outcomes of developing areas for the worst. There was such a strong emphasis to keep development from happening in areas predominantly occupied by people of color. They would even firebomb homes, people would be charged with criminal offenses, people would be brutally attacked just for trying to mix black and white people into the same neighborhood. So now I'm going to get into high opportunity and low opportunity areas. So it's important to understand why not just housing, but creating neighborhoods with division, specifically division with different incomes matters. So a low opportunity area is an area that is low income, distressed, and typically has larger rates of crime and poverty. Low opportunity areas have limited or unreliable transportation, lesser employment opportunities, low performing schools, limited childcare, less healthcare clinics, and much lower quality of life. But a high opportunity area is an area filled with higher income population. Little crime typically has development happening, schools, hospitals, stores, and many other resources are nearby. So this is just a little visual. So over here we have new sidewalks, new schools, because the people that live there are higher income and they, the taxes are going to these things and people want to develop and put more money into these areas. But in a lower income area, people don't want to put as much money and develop them, and there's just not already the money there to develop them. So we have rundown schools, we have rundown sidewalks, we have more crime, we don't have childcare, we have healthcare clinics far away. So the zip code you live in determines the opportunities available and the quality of life in the neighborhood. Low opportunity areas are one way that the poor stay poor and the divide and the inequality in the housing market stays. Creating regulations that require cheaper housing to be included in wealthier neighborhoods helps combat the division of high and low opportunity areas. It's important to spread different incomes throughout for equal opportunity. Okay, so now I'm just gonna explain supply and demand. So supply and demand is key to understanding when trying to grasp how the housing market works and why housing prices are rising. So supply is the amount of goods or services that are available in the market. And demand is the amount of good or services that people need and want to buy. When there is low inventory of housing coupled with high material costs, housing prices increase. A study I read by Santorelli stated that the COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted global supply chains and caused shortages of raw materials, driving up costs and delaying construction projects. In addition, tariffs on imported materials have increased costs for builders, making it more challenging to create affordable housing. So, when there is a high supply, or when there is a low supply, but high demand, the cost is going to go up to keep up with the demand. But, when there is a lot of supply and a little demand, the cost will go down so more people will buy it. So, Airbnb, so short-term rentals and second homes are a big part of the housing crisis, especially in small towns and just more desirable locations. So, second home buyers and short-term rentals are taking away from the available pool of properties. So let's say we have a neighborhood filled with 10 new build homes. Five of them are bought by families that work and live in the area. But five of them are bought and become second homes or short-term rentals. We now have five less available homes that could supply housing to a local working family. So controlling second home buyers isn't very feasible or possible. There has been regulations and ideas to tax them higher if they have a second home, but if someone has the money to buy the house and pay the taxes, no one can tell them that they can't. But the amount of short-term rentals like Airbnb and VRBO can be regulated by the area's local government. Although the regulations that aim to control the amount of them and where they can be specifically located often are violated. One article I read from Airbnb Tales, a website that shares real people's stories with Airbnb, stated that enforcing regulations on short-term rentals can be difficult. It often leads to issues with tax collection, zoning, and adherence to safety standards. Many Airbnb rentals sometimes violate local zoning laws. So in La Plata County, we have 320 total Airbnb properties and 941 total VRBO properties. That's over a thousand possible properties that people could be living in. And then in La Plata County, this is from 2021, it's the most recent data I could find, but it stated that 80% of homes sold over $1 million were sold to second homeowners and investors. That's a huge percent. Almost, we're seeing so many houses nowadays selling for upwards of a million dollars, 80% of that going to second home buyers 
is terrifying. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to get into solutions soon, but before I get into those, we're going to talk about some of the obstacles and mindsets people have that battle them. So first we have NIFI, which means not in my backyard. Many people have strong opinions on lesser income homes being near them. Some people feel that this makes the area less safe, less appealing, or feel it targets their ego in some way. They've worked hard to, have this, to live in this nice neighborhood and they don't want cheaper homes anywhere near them. But bigger than that is that people look at houses as assets and if this is their primary investment for building wealth, why would they want the price dropped? Yes, for most your home is your biggest financial asset. However, building more affordable units near you isn't going to completely destroy the value of your asset. Affordable housing isn't dangerous or gross or negative. Especially in this market, your asset is not going to just decrease. Your home value isn't going to decrease so significantly you're going to lose money, especially in this market, just because there's more affordable homes near you. And more importantly than that, housing is a necessity. So no matter your, it's your asset or you don't want it near you, it doesn't really matter. People need a place to live. So now we're gonna get into some solutions. So the housing crisis is only continuing to worsen. And with the cost of living going up, it's time to start looking into solutions. Looking into and supporting local projects that aim to help provide housing and combat the crisis is one great way to get involved. So for example, we have like tiny home communities in Durango and in Buena Vista, they have this modular home factory that they're putting out into other Durango towns. So just looking into what's around you and what you can get involved in and support is really important. Secondly, and much more crucial than that, is to be aware of what is being talked about nationally. We have our presidential election coming up soon. So looking into what both candidates are planning to endorse with the housing crisis, and looking at what they've actually done is super important. And then lastly, and equally important or more important, is being aware of local regulations and bills that are upcoming and deciding what you want to advocate for and support. Getting involved locally is very powerful. You're going to see that change happening all around you. So this is just an example of the modular homes compared to a new build home. This is just the average prices from what I got. But a modular home on average costs 189,000 and a new build home costs 535,000. Obviously, a modular home is a little bit smaller, might be a little bit less nice, but for most that doesn't matter. People just need a place to live. And then I'm gonna get into some of the more specific regulations and solutions. So starting off with local and state regulations. We had Prop HH, um, which is a Colorado property tax relief plan. So Proposition HH would limit the increase in Colorado's property taxes each year by hundreds of millions of dollars, if not more than one billion. But over time, Coloradans would get billions less in tax refunds as the state government redirect, redirected those dollars to schools and other local agencies. This could have provided relief for over the next 10 years to property owners. However, it was really complex and it didn't pass because of miscommunications on how it worked and what it would really do. And then secondly, in Fort Collins, there was a new land use code and it was passed, but it was repealed a couple months later. And this code was going to increase building density and allow ADUs or accessory dwelling units. So the goal of this was to provide opportunities for more housing um, in the area to help slow down the crisis. But there was big concerns that it was gonna do nothing. A local even stated that the proposed new land development code will have little to no impact on affordable housing, as some contend it will. So the code is repealed and it's currently being revised to better solve the housing problem. So although these aren't in action currently, this is just some examples of what you can look into and see what's going on so you know what you want to advocate for and support. And then nationally, so nationally the biggest organization that I found was HUD, which is the Housing and Urban Development. So they, their website is filled with a ton of different things that they do, but here's just two things that I thought were important and looked like they were impactful. So the first one is Community Development Block Grant, and this supports community development activities to build stronger and more resilient communities. Some examples of the activities they address are infrastructure, public facilities, community centers, public services, code enforcement, homeowner assistance, and more. And then the Housing Choice Voucher Program, Section 8, was, is the federal government's major program for assisting very low-income families, elderly, and disabled to afford decent, safe, and sanitary housing in the private market. So those are just some of my examples of things that we can do.
Thank you, Caitlin.